Chapter 1. The Signs of the Time. Today is Jack Kettle's 40th birthday. What's so special about Jack Kettle, you might ask? Well, on one hand, nothing. However, on the other hand, everything. You see, based on outside appearances, Jack would appear to be your average ordinary 40-year-old man. And this is something that must be clearly understood, or else no good may ever come from the telling of Jack's story. Jack has a life that most 40-year-old men would envy, having many of the things that men work hard to achieve. Jack has a successful career, a loving wife, and three beautiful children. Jack lives in a beautiful suburban Chicago home, along with one large faithful black Labrador retriever named Newton and a pet mouse named Trixie. The pet mouse belongs to his 10-year-old daughter, Ellen. She found it while she and two of her best friends were playing in the sand pile behind the local neighborhood softball field. Ellen's younger brother, Josh, doesn't really like rats and teases Ellen all the time about Trixie. Jack also has two new cars parked in his driveway. One of them is not actually a car, but rather a minivan that his wife Julie uses to haul the kids back and forth to school each day, as well as making the weekly trip to the local Kroger store or drive to her part-time job as an assistant manager at a local preschool. Jack's own personal car is really his work car. Since Jack is regional sales manager for a large industrial insurance company based in Chicago, he needs a car that looks well, professional. He wanted a much sportier car, but since it had to serve as his company car too, Jack settled for the four-door gray sedan import of, well, let's say, mild sportiness, to say the least. Jack attends church regularly, and that seems to make most men like Jack, an instant hit at the monthly Rotary Club or local school board meetings. Even though Jack regularly attends church, it's mostly because he feels it's the right thing to do provided it's convenient and fits within his busy schedule. And such is the life of Jack, but everything you've learned so far is only the beginning of Jack's story. It seems that Jack Kettle has acquired a disease. The good news for Jack is that this disease is not fatal, at least not usually. The bad news for Jack is that there is no known cure. Although he doesn't know it yet, this disease is going to drastically change his life. Each year, millions of men will get the same disease as Jack. At the onset of this disease, men may not even be aware that they have it, and then when they are aware, the disease often strangely disappears. Luckily for most men, this is the case. Occasionally, women may get this disease also, but usually it's a man's disease. Not to say that men brag about it, oh no. It's just that the male brain, for some reason, is wired to catch this disease, and Jack, well, he doesn't know it yet but his brain is perfectly wired for it. So, what are the symptoms of this disease, you ask? It usually begins with a series of unfulfilled desires and unattainable dreams. It's the progression of the ever-present clock that resides deep inside one's brain that ticks and talks at the same pace every second of every single day, and it never seems to lose any time or give any time away. Perhaps you've heard the expression, keeping one's nose to the grindstone, or the old proverb, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. It is all the time a man spends, or it's the time that is gained. It's the time of your life when there's no time at all. It's about making up for lost time, or for some, it's having too much time, while for others, it's the worry of too little time left at all. This disease can come and go in a flicker of an eye, or it can haunt a man forever, like a ghost of the past stuck in a graveyard of put-off dreams. Strangely enough, the only known cure for this disease is the complete ignorance of time. And that, in and of itself, is the greatest danger. For if one chooses to ignore time, the danger of a relapse in the future becomes even more likely. But wait, you're probably wondering why all of this is a problem, since it has already been made clear that Jack has everything a 40-year-old man needs, right? Well, that's the reason why you must hear the rest of Jack's story. But whatever you do, don't judge Jack too harshly until you've heard the whole story. So as the story begins, let's zoom into the home of Jack Kettle, who is currently fast asleep in his bed on the morning of his 40th birthday. It's 5.58 a.m. and Jack is dreaming. Have you ever had one of those dreams where you just don't want to wake up from? Jack is having one of those dreams this morning. It is just about time for the radio to turn on at 6 o'clock which is Jack's usual wake-up time. 
When the radio comes on, it will be playing an old Jim Croce song, Time in a Bottle. As Jack lies in his bed, rubbing his eyes and pondering the thought of another day, he suddenly realizes that today is his 40th birthday. Jack rolls over in bed to snooze a few minutes longer, trying to catch five more minutes of sleep. He deserves it. After all, it is his birthday. As he closes his eyes and begins to slowly drift off again into his dream, he catches himself humming along with the chorus of the song. There never seems to be enough time to do the things you want to do once you find them. And so the song continued playing as Jack hums quietly along. In his dream, he saw himself hiking up the side of Mount Whitney and nearing the summit in the middle of summer as he begins hearing a strange sound coming from the foot of his bed. Jack spins over on his back and sits up quickly, pushing back his dark brown hair up and over the top of his head as he opens his eyes, scratches his whisker stubble, and tries to focus on the source of the sound. Newton, who let you in? He mumbles, reaching down to pat Newton, his three-year-old black Labrador retriever, on the head. As it turns out, the strange noise he heard was only Newton sucking one of his front paws like a baby might suck on a pacifier. He lies back down in bed again, trying to close his eyes and return to his dream. Just a few more minutes, please, he thinks to himself as he tries to remember the view of the forest below on the summit that he was approaching a moment ago in his dream. Suddenly, he hears a loud bang on the door of his bedroom, startling him out of his dream and causing Jack to suddenly sit up again as Julie enters the bedroom in a hurry. Jack, do you know where I put my new red belt? the one I bought at the store last night. Remember, the one I picked out because it just matched my red Celines that I bought last week? Asks Julie as she quickly enters and then exits the bedroom again in her frantic search for her new red belt. So much for the five extra minutes, he thinks, starting to lie down again, but deciding against it. No, honey, I can't say I remember where you put your belt, replies Jack groggily, sliding his feet out from under the covers, and landing them soundly on the floor on his side of the bed. Jack begins to yawn and stretches his arms to the ceiling, trying to shake off the usual early morning fatigue. Then, looking down on the dark floor for his slippers, he suddenly realizes where Julie's red belt is. Jack turns around and sees Newton still sucking his paw at the foot of the bed. Newton, you better run now, he whispers, as Newton discontinues his paw sucking for a moment, gazing innocently up at him. There, lying on the floor, next to his slippers, is Julie's new red belt. Well, it was new anyway. He moves his left leg out from the side of the bed, grabbing the belt carefully with the toe of his left foot. He then slides the belt swiftly underneath the bed. There, he thinks it's hidden now. I'll take care of the evidence later. Then he wonders how to break the news to Julie. Should I do it now? Later, he decides. There's always time to do that later. Maybe I can even pick a new one up for her and she'll never know the difference. Tsra. Julie returns through the bedroom door and stops. Oh, I'm so sorry, Jack. I almost forgot. Julie smiles, auburn hair bouncing off her slim, athletic shoulders. Happy birthday, sweetie, she says, apparently forgetting all about the belt, at least for the moment, as she continues putting makeup on while carrying on a conversation. By the way, Jack, I called Bob and Marsha last night after we got home, and they said they could probably come over for an hour or maybe two this evening for some cake and ice cream. And I also called your friend Peter, too. But he's not sure if they can make it at 7, since his wife Trisha has late staff meetings at the school Tuesday afternoons, explained Julie, with a slightly faked, pouty expression. Oh, why does she have to do that? Jack wonders. That's great, honey. Don't worry about it. I understand it's going to be hard to get a group together at the same time, especially on a weeknight. They'll get here when they get here. It sucks to have a birthday on a weekday, sighs Jack. Hey, don't forget, honey. I'm going to invite Gary from the office over, too. No problem, sweetie. Julie continues her way through the bedroom, quickly returning to her morning routine, as Jack reaches over and gives Newton another pat on the head which he gratefully receives. You're a damn lucky dog, Newton. So lucky, in fact. I think today is your lucky day. It must be your birthday, too, says Jack, giving Newton a final pat on the head. 
Once he finally makes it up and out of bed, Jack continues with his usual morning routine. Get showered, get shaved, get dressed, eat breakfast, have coffee, feed Newton, and so on. Routines are something Jack has become good at over the years. Once in a great while, Jack will stop and think back at a time in his younger days when he didn't have such routines and wonders how he managed to survive at all. Even so, Jack occasionally dreams of living a day with so much time there would be no need for routines. Mom, are you going to pick me up from softball practice this afternoon, or will Dad? asks Ellen as she walks around the house with Trixie perched on her shoulder. Trixie is Ellen's pet white mouse she acquired a few weeks ago from her best friend Molly, who lives a few houses down the street. Sweetheart, I really wish you wouldn't play with Trixie like that in the morning, especially before you've even had your breakfast, scolds Julie from the kitchen. Dad, can I go to the pet store or buy a new cage this weekend for Trixie? Do you really plan on keeping her that long, sweetheart? asks Jack, stepping out into the hallway. Nearly complete with his morning routine, except for breakfast, which Julie has nearly finished cooking up on the stove. Of course, Dad, Trixie and I are best friends, smiles Ellen, holding Trixie up in the air like an airplane on the return trip to her cage in Ellen's room. Jack sits down in his usual morning spot at the kitchen table, plate and glass arranged neatly, with silverware and juice glass laid out and ready for use. As he pours orange juice into his glass, he catches the local news report on the television. Good morning, Chicago. Here is our local traffic reporter, Jane Houston, with the morning traffic report. Jane? The news continues. Thank you, Daryl. Well, if you're planning on heading into downtown Chicago this morning on the eastbound lane of the I-90, use caution. There's been a two-car accident just east of the North Meacham Road, approaching the 53 off-ramp, so plan for time delays in your morning drive. The news report continues as Jack begins to eat his breakfast. He sighs in between bites of sausage. You okay, Jack? Julie asks. Yep, just trying to decide how to get around that accident and get to work on time, explains Jack. Glad that I don't have to go in so early tomorrow. We have a late morning meeting and that will give me some extra time. Do they know it's your birthday today at work? Yeah, I think Sandy passed the word around last week. She was trying to be sneaky about it and not let me know, continued Jack. Week before last, I saw her walking around the office with a large manila envelope in her hand, going around to everyone's office but mine. Every time she passed by my door, she had this silly grin on her face. Julie giggles. After finishing his breakfast, Jack tops off his cup of coffee and goes out into the family room to sit down at his favorite chair and proceeds read the news on his tablet computer. As is usual, little Teddy, who recently turned five, is sitting at his favorite place in the middle in the floor in front of the television, playing with his robot dolls and his Lego blocks, waiting until Julie feeds him his breakfast. Jack looks around carefully so as not to trip over him. Good morning, Daddy, smiles Teddy. Good morning, Teddy, says Jack, reaching over and patting him on the head. You gonna build me something this morning? Sure, what do you want? I'd like a race car. A race car? asks Teddy, eyes lighting up at the possibilities. You want a fast one, Daddy? A really, really fast one. One that can fly over traffic on the freeway, Jack says, making flying airplane motions in the air with his hand. Teddy's expression suddenly turned serious, considering how he is going to make his father a race car that can fly. Moments later, he is busily constructing his new car. The quietness is suddenly broken as Ellen and Josh come running down the hallway into the kitchen. Ellen is screaming at Josh as Josh has Trixie riding on his back. Mom, Dad, Josh won't give me Trixie, Ellen screams. He says he's going to flush Trixie down the toilet or feed him to Mr. Johnson's cat next door, yells Ellen, grasping for Trixie, who is barely hanging on to Josh's t-shirt with all four claws. I'm just kidding. Josh, hand Trixie back to your sister this instant, hollers Julie who was busy preparing a place for little Teddy at the table. Jack, as usual, seems remarkably able to tune this entire morning hubbub out. Even though he could sense the drama around him, he is still able to ignore it. Sometimes this ability of Jack's to tune everything out drives Julie crazy. Jack, will you have a little talk with your son about leaving Trixie alone and not making threats, insisted Julie. 
Yes, honey, I will, mumbles Jack, as he continues reading through his morning online issue of USA Today. Jack continues reading the news, while his thoughts begin to drift off. As he reads, his imagination begins to take hold of his thoughts, while simultaneously he sips his coffee and reads the news. His mind drifts off to other faraway places, looking over the pictures of exotic locations in the travel section, as some might look over pictures of cars or motorcycles. There before him are pictures of the beautifully exotic golden coastal beaches of South America. And then there are photos and reviews of the exclusive French restaurants along the Champs-Élysées, all in glorious view of the Eiffel Tower. Jack's imagination begins to take him to places far away, if only for a few quiet moments. Finally, a little alarm goes off on Jack's tablet computer, signaling that it is time to go to work, waking Jack up from his second dream of the morning. Jack stands up from his chair, turning off his tablet and returning it to the charger. He then grabs his briefcase, which he always keeps at ready by the side of the refrigerator. Then grabbing his freshly prepared gourmet coffee mug off the kitchen counter, he reaches for his car keys, which were hanging on a specially prepared wall calendar near the hallway closet. He reluctantly makes his way to the front door. Julie is standing by the side of the door waiting for him, smiling in her usual fashion. Have a good day, honey, she says, kissing him lightly on the cheek. Thanks, and you too. I'll call you when I leave the office after work, he assures Julie, giving her a kiss on the opposite cheek. Jack tosses his briefcase into the back seat of his sedan and pulls out of the driveway, thus beginning his hour-long daily trek to work. Jack Kettle's home is in the lovely, quiet little suburb of Northwest Chicago, known as Crystal Lake, and he's been commuting every day for the last 10 years to the office of a major insurance company he has worked for, located in downtown Chicago. Every morning he takes his usual route to and from work. If traffic works in his favor, he can usually make the trip in about one hour. Unfortunately, this morning might take a little more time than usual since Jack will have to find a detour around an accident on the interstate. Jack's thoughts begin to drift off as he pulls his gray sedan up onto the on-eastbound lane of Interstate 90. Slipping swiftly underneath the Elgin Plaza toll bridge, thanks to his convenient eye pass, he begins to settle in for the long drive to work and a peaceful time of quiet solitude alone. Suddenly, Jack hears an old, familiar song playing on the radio station and reaches over to turn it up. It was a song that his older brother Sam used to play all the time when he was little. As he starts humming along, he struggles trying to remember the name of the song. I'm tired of holding on to a feeling I know is gone. He continues singing along. Oh, I make you laugh and you make me cry. I believe it's time for me to fly, he sings. Suddenly, Jack notices a large billboard sign off to the side of the freeway that causes him to do a quick double take as he reads the sign. Got time, it asks in large white letters. Wait a minute, that's not right, he thinks to himself. Rubbing his eyes with one hand, he opens them again as the message on the sign mysteriously disappears. That's strange, thinks Jack as he continues his morning drive to work. Chapter 2, The Office Party Damn, I'm 15 minutes late, Jack mumbled to no one particular as he entered the elevator taking him up to the fifth floor of the Murphy Thomas building. He does a quick checklist in his head as he watches the red numbers change on the elevator panel in front of him, first floor, second floor, third, and so on. The bells ring and the doors slide open, sending Jack on his way down the hallway to the fifth office on the north side of the building. Looking down for a moment at his watch to check the time again, Jack looks up to realize he's not the only one who is late this morning. Good morning, Mr. Kettle smiles the young, blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jennifer Kinsley, one of the younger sales reps, just starting her second year with the company. Morning, Miss Kinsley, and please just call me Jack. Jack notices Jennifer fumbling for something in her purse. Here, let me get that for you, says Jack, opening the door for her. She smiles at Jack, blue eyes, and long eyelashes flashing for a moment at him. Why, thanks, mister. I mean, thanks, Jack. Jennifer squeaks. Just call me Jen. My stupid phone keeps dropping to the bottom of my purse right when I'm trying to finish up a text message. Jack does his best to keep a poker face, 
though he finds it difficult. No problem. I guess the traffic on the freeway this morning was rough for you too? Jack asks as the two of them step into the main lobby of the office, which fortunately is empty now. Oh my God, was it ever... I would have been here 20 minutes ago if it weren't for that. I drive in from Elgin every morning, and I've never seen it that bad. How about you, Jack? What's that? Jack replies, shaking his head slightly. He stops a moment at the front desk to check the Friday memos, trying hard to appear casual and aloof. Move on, keep focused, Jack, he reminds himself. So, where do you drive in from Jack? Jennifer asks with her high-pitched, moderately squeaky voice. Crystal Lake area, he replies. I'll bet it was Frank Lofton that hired her. Frank always was a sucker for the blondes, thinks Jack. Jack finds the Friday sales memo he was looking for and quickly whisks it off the tray. She must know I'm married. Can't she see my ring? He wonders to himself. He starts to feel his pulse rising slightly as Jen moves in closer to him on his left and reaches right across in front of his face for her copy of the very same memo. For a moment, he catches a whiff of a very familiar scent. What is that? He wonders silently again. Molecule, he mumbles in a low voice, obviously not low enough though. He remembered trying to buy some of that for Julie's birthday last year. He liked it. The sales lady told him it was supposed to enhance sexual desires, so he bought it, but she hated it. What's that? Oh yeah, she replies. It's called Molecule One. It's my boyfriend's favorite. She grins. He turns around in time to see the mischievous grin forming on Jen's airbrushed, cosmetically perfect face, just before she turns around and leaves for her office. Jack lifts his briefcase up onto the front desk, opening it up to place the memo inside, while removing some claim forms that need to be completed and turned in this morning for his customers, when suddenly he hears a familiar voice approaching from behind. Good morning, Jack. How are you doing? asks Tracy Becknell, the company's main receptionist, as she returns to her usual spot at the front desk. Tracy is one of the few employees who's been around longer than Jack, partially because she's not one to take crap off anyone who gives her a hard time, but mostly because she does a good job and keeps everyone organized. I'm sorry I'm so late this morning, Trace. The I-90 this morning had a huge backup on the eastbound lanes, so I had to take a detour around. Unfortunately, my detour wasn't any better, and it too had problems, hissed Jack, while continuing to complete the forms. Any news from the underwriters regarding the Medicare account? I told them we'd have a response to their claim by the end of the week, last week. No, Jack, I'm sorry. Nothing's come across my desk for you from them, but as soon as it does, I will let you know, assured Tracy. Oh, by the way, Morgan wants everyone to know that there's a special staff meeting at 11 in the main conference room, smiles Tracy, and your presence is requested. Please tell me you will be able to make it, she winks. Let me guess, is Sandy involved? Tracy nods. I'll be there. In the meantime, I'll be over in my office making some phone calls if anyone needs me. Jack continues completing the forms he was working on and then hands them over to Tracy. Here, Trace, I need these to be faxed over to the central office this morning, before noon, insists Jack. Tracy nods and takes the forms as she slides them carefully into one of the trays stacked near the side of her desk, then looks up at Jack for a moment with a look of curiosity. Jack starts to turn and leave, then pauses. What's up, Trace? You got that look in your eye? Tracy raises one eyebrow. I noticed you and Jennifer talking a few minutes ago, she says, grinning slightly. Jack's eyes widen slightly as he rolls them from side to side. What about her? Watch out for her, Jack. Tracy bites her bottom lip. What do you mean? Tracy lowers her voice and continues. Well, she's got Morgan wrapped around her finger. Jack, it's unbelievable. He's letting her take the rest of the week off starting this Thursday to make an out-of-town trip with her new boyfriend, Trace continues. Talk about lucky. Really? Must be nice to be blonde, comments Jack, surprised that Morgan would allow that, especially knowing that this is peak season for the company. Tracy chuckles slightly. She confided in me last week, you know, woman to woman, that she thinks he's taking her to Las Vegas to propose to her and get married and get this, Tracy continues. She hasn't even decided whether or not she'll accept if he does propose to her. Jack shakes his head slightly. 
Well, looks like Morgan's not the only one she's got wrapped around her finger. Thanks for the advice, but you know, I'm a married man. Jack turns around and begins to leave, while behind him he hears Tracy mumble softly, I don't think it matters to her. Jack sits quietly at his desk, after softly placing the telephone receiver back into its holder and leans back in his chair. He turns his head slightly to check the time. I guess I'd better get going. It's almost 11, he suddenly realizes, thinking to himself. As Jack begins walking down the hallway to the conference room, he hears a commotion. Then a sudden quiet comes over the room. He laughs quietly. They're really having a hard time with this surprise, he thinks, as Jack enters the conference room. Surprise, happy birthday, Jack. Everyone yells out as Jack steps into the room, as everyone begins breaking out in a group rendition of the happy birthday song. Jack pretends to be surprised for a few moments, opening his eyes wide and dropping his jaw. You guys didn't have to do this, he says. In the middle of the conference room is a large oval table. On that table, there sits a specially prepared birthday cake for Jack. A stack of plates, napkins, forks, and a large metal cake knife all arranged neatly near the middle, with one large wrapped gift package lying on the floor in the corner of the room. Jack suddenly notices Morgan Hill, the district manager grinning at him from the opposite corner of the room. The salt and pepper haired Hill is really only a few years older than Jack, but he's been working for the company ever since he graduated from college. Standing next to the slim Morgan, is a younger and slightly heavier built, blonde haired man named Kyle Burton. He's the company's Western sales manager, whom Jack is somewhat surprised to see this morning since Kyle is usually traveling all over and rarely stops in for branch office visits. You guys didn't have to do this, Jack exclaims. Come on, Jack, what do you mean? You're our top guy around here. We're just trying to show you how important you are we wouldn't want to lose you to Prudential or one of our other competitors. Morgan laughs. I know it's not even lunchtime yet, but Sandy, let's go ahead and start serving up the cake and ice cream anyway. What do you say, Jack? Sounds good to me, he says, as Jack notices someone tapping on his shoulder. His friend Gary Sanders and Tracy are standing behind him holding a large envelope. Gary has been working for the company nearly as long as him and is one of the few in the company he considers a true friend. Hey Jack, congratulations. I know this is probably killing you, says Gary, but we got this card last week and sort of passed it around and well, everyone signed it. Happy birthday. You're right, it's killing me, Jack laughs, but thanks anyway. Come here, Jack, you get the first piece bellows Sandy, who is busy cutting the cake while Jennifer is dishing up the ice cream. Jack makes his way through the crowd to where Sandy is readying the cake. Thanks, Sandy. I appreciate you and Morgan putting this all together and all the extra time you spent. Not at all. Don't worry about it, says Sandy, while shoving a paper plate, fork, and napkin into his hands while she carefully lays down the first slice of cake on his plate. Red Velvet, how did you know? I called your wife, whispers Sandy. Jack smiles. Don't forget your ice cream, Jack, insists Jennifer. Which do you prefer, vanilla or chocolate? Well, Miss Kinsley, from you, either one will be just fine. Jennifer smiles and places a scoop of both on his plate. As most of the 20 or so people in the room eventually fill up their plates with cake and ice cream, the conversations continue for several minutes as everyone shares a birthday greeting with Jack and reminisces about the earlier years when Jack first started with the company. Suddenly, Morgan stands up and calls for attention. Everyone, listen up. I hate to stop all the fun, but I want to offer a toast to Jack. Not only has he been a great guy to have on our team for 10 years now, but also for being a good example an inspiration for the rest of us in living right. You're such a lucky man, Jack. Happy birthday and many more. Morgan raises his plastic cup of soda in the air and then takes a sip. Now, Sandy, I think there's one more thing we need to do. Oh, right, Mr. Hill. Jack, come over here, orders Sandy, standing by the large package in the corner of the room. As Jack makes his way over, she begins talking. Jack, we decided to all pitch in this year and get you something special. I mean, it's hard to shop for a man who has everything. So we did a little snooping around and found out you have always dreamed of going hiking up the Sierra Mountains. Am I right? 
Sandy pauses, looking over at his friend Gary. Sorry, Jack. They forced it out of me, says Gary, shrugging his shoulders. So, we got you something that you can use to fulfill your dream. Sandy hands the package to Jack as he begins to tear off the paper. Come on, Jack, rip it off, yells Morgan. Jack raises an eyebrow and grins. Okay, I'm not sure that would be appropriate here, he adds, noticing a blush forming over on Jennifer's face. As he pulls the paper off the package, he begins to realize what it is. A mountain backpack. Wow, guys, how did you know? Thank you. Now I just must find the nearest mountain to climb. Don't think that means I'm giving you time off, Jack, says Morgan, with a serious tone at first, as he then breaks into laughter. At least not until summer comes. Aw, oh, why not, Morgan? yells Gary offhandedly, stepping over to where Jack is standing, still ogling over his gift. Do you like it? Oh yeah, you bet. You had to tell them, didn't you? Well, Jack, one of these days we got to plan something special. You know, with just us guys, you, me, Peter, and maybe Bob too for that matter, a getaway trip somewhere, anywhere. Yeah, that sounds fun, Gary. Hey, by the way, don't forget tonight. We're having a get-together at my place at 7, if you can make it. We can talk about that trip idea. Sure, who all is coming over? Julie called and invited Bob and Marcia, as well as Peter and his wife, Trisha. Can I invite my girlfriend over too, if she can make it, that is? Of course you can, of course, no problem. It's just a little get together. Hard to plan a huge party on a weeknight, you know. Gary pats him on the shoulder. Seven o'clock, I'll be there. Got to get back to work, bud. See you later. As Gary steps away, Jack returns to admiring his present, as Morgan moves next to him and places his hand on his shoulder. Jack, all kidding aside, I feel you really do deserve a vacation. If I had it in my power, I'd give you time off right now. But this is peak season for us. Things will start to slow down by May, and then you're welcome to put in for your vacation time after that. Okay? Suggests Morgan, as he begins to take notice to Jennifer Kinsley. Yeah, thanks, Morgan. I think I will. Jack started to ask him how Miss Kinsley managed to get her time off approved for the rest of the week, but decided it would be a subject better off left alone for the moment. So, how are things going for you, Morgan? How's your wife and the boys doing? He asks, trying to get Morgan refocused once again. As he is beginning to realize Morgan is very likely enamored with the attractive Miss Kinsley. Oh, not bad. Not bad at all. They're doing just fine, mumbles Morgan as he seems distracted for a moment, then turns around again. Hey Jack, don't forget tomorrow we have a late morning staff meeting at 11, so you don't need to come in early, sleep in, celebrate your birthday with the family tonight, mutters Morgan. Haven't forgotten, I'll be in a little before 11. Jack watches, as Morgan continues staring over at Jennifer Kinsley while she's busy talking with Karen Young over in the corner. Karen is one of the other young sales reps that are new in the company and is a just few years older than Jennifer. Uh, well then, I think I'm gonna get back to work, Morgan. Thanks again for the party, says Jack as he grabs up his gift and heads to the door. Okay, Jack. Oh, hey, if you have a minute or two later this afternoon, I want to go over some ideas with you regarding a new project. I've been putting a portfolio together on a construction project out in Nevada. I think you might be interested. We're going to be underwriting a new commercial construction project in Las Vegas, and it looks really promising. Could turn out to be a real moneymaker. Sure, Morgan, drop by my office, say around 3.30, replied Jack, not quite sure how he might figure in Morgan's new project. That sounds good, Morgan added. Catch you later, Jack. Jack turned and headed down the corridor back to his office, wondering how he's going to explain the new backpack to Julie. I think I will just leave it in my car for a while, he decides. He knows how funny Julie is about vacations. It bothers him how she always insists that they visit the in-laws during his vacation time. Just one of these days, Jack would like to do something different. He begins, just for a moment or two, to drift off as he did earlier in the morning, back to the golden, exotic coastal beaches of South America. Chapter 3. Home. Jack, would you please go out to the patio and make sure that all the drinks have been iced down for the party tonight? I forgot to do that after I got home. Thank you, 
hollers Julie from the bedroom, since she's still getting dressed for the party, as Jack quickly glances at his watch. 6.15. Better late than never, I suppose, he mumbles to himself. Sure, honey, I'll get it right now. Jack gets up from his chair, where he had been trying to catch a quick nap, and walks into the kitchen and opens the freezer. He grabs a large ice bag stored inside, then walks out to the patio where he finds the large blue tub already filled up with ice, but no soda or beer anywhere to be found. Hmm, he mutters to himself, shaking his head slightly as he heads back into the kitchen. Julie, where did you put the beer and the soda when you got home this afternoon? Everything is in the tub already. She replies from the bedroom. Jack begins to respond, but decides against it. It had been a long day, and he already had an idea as to where the beer and soda likely were. Jack returns the extra ice that he had been carrying around to the freezer, then steps out into the garage and lifts the tailgate on the minivan. Sure enough, there are several 12 packs of beer and soda sitting in the rear of the van that never made it in the house. Jack sighs and then grabs as many cases of soda as he can and takes them out to the patio. A few minutes later, as Jack finishes unloading the beer and soda and mixing in the ice around them, Ellen walks out to the patio holding Trixie. Hi, Dad. Isn't tonight your birthday party? She asks. Yes, sweetie, it is. Your mom and I are just taking care of a few last-minute details. What's up? Can I go over to my friend Mary's house tonight for a little while? It's okay with me, but you better ask your mom first. And don't forget, you got school tomorrow, so you can't stay past nine. Thanks, Dad, she replies, grabbing an ice cube from the blue tub. Here, Trixie, have some ice. No sooner does Ellen go back in the house than Josh comes out next. Hi, Dad. Cool. Can I have a soda? Sure, grab one. Jack looks over at Josh as he opens the can of soda, noticing the look of a question forming on Josh's face. Let me guess. You want to go play with your friend Jason tonight, I suppose? Josh gives his dad a puzzled look. What? Uh... Not exactly. I was kind of wondering if Jason could come over here tonight. He and I can play video games in my room, and I promise we won't bother anyone or disturb you during your party tonight. Don't forget, Peter and Trisha are coming over tonight, along with Bob and Marcia, and I think they're going to bring their sons, Michael and Robert, with them, so you might want to wait to have your friend Jason over later on sometime. Really, Mike and Robert are coming over too? asks Josh, scratching his head trying to decide if there would be enough room for all four of them to play in his bedroom or not. Oh, don't forget, Mom and I want you to keep an eye on Teddy for us during the party tonight, at least for a while, insists Jack. Josh sighs. Come on, Dad, do I have to? Realizing there won't be enough room now for all four of them. Why can't Ellen watch Teddy instead? Because she's going over to her friend Mary's house tonight, so she can't. Josh gave his dad a hurt look, but he suddenly got an idea of how he could keep Teddy busy with Trixie tonight and changes his mood. Okay, Dad, no problem. I'll watch Teddy for you and Mom. As Josh turns around and quickly heads back into the house, I wonder what made him change his mind so fast. Jack thought it was nearly eight and the ice cream and cake had already been served up as the Julie invited the other ladies into the family room to show them her new scrapbooking projects. Meanwhile, the four men decided to grab some beer and relax on the patio. Jack started up the propane heaters set up on each side of the porch to give them some extra warmth as it had started to get a bit chilly outside. I love spring, remarked Peter. My favorite time of year. Peter grabbed one of the patio chairs from the side and slid it closer to the heater. It was nice today, almost warm enough to make me want to take off work and go play some golf. Do they let you teachers do that? asked Gary. Do what? Take a day off for golf? Bob reached into the blue tub and grabbed a cold beer, then popped the top off his can, making a loud noise. He's not a teacher, Gary. He's administration. They give them special privileges, laughed Bob. Oh, right. Sure they do, replied Peter sarcastically. Except tomorrow, I get to miss school for an hour in the morning because of a special district meeting. I don't have to go in until 10. Gary and I don't have to go in until 11, bragged Jack. We have a late meeting tomorrow. Morgan even said to me, sleep in Jack, celebrate, said Jack, imitating Morgan. So I am, and I will, the others laughed.
Speaking of celebrating Jack, when are we going to plan our first mancation? Our what? Bob asks. A mancation, you know, an all-guys road trip, camping, fishing, hiking, says Gary, poking Jack in the shoulder. Did you tell the guys yet? Tell us what? Asked Bob and Peter simultaneously. About the gift we gave him this morning at the office, urged Gary. By the way, where is it? I left it in the trunk of my car. What? Shrilled Gary. Oh, let me guess. You don't want Julie to see it, I'll bet. Gary shook his head. Man, that's why I'm glad I'm still single. I like doing what I want when I want. I enjoy having my freedom, said Gary. Jack gave Gary a look for a moment. Sometimes he secretly envied Gary, not having a wife or family to worry about. Even so, there was something about Gary that he wasn't always sure about. What did you get, Jack? Tell us, asks Peter, interrupting Jack's thoughts. Jack cleared his throat slightly. Everyone pitched in and bought me a mountain backpack, a real nice one too, said Jack. Why don't you want to show it to Julie? asked Peter. She freaks out with stuff like that. She thinks that all our vacation time should be spent taking the kids to visit with their grandparents, explains Jack. She says we can save the other trips for when the kids get older. Since her folks are in Florida and mine are in California, well, that sort of limits our vacation possibilities. Do you ever mention that maybe once in a while you'd like to go somewhere else? Asks Bob. I mean, Marsha and I always try to plan separate getaway trips for just the two of us at least once a year, in addition to all our regular family trips. Jack, do you remember our second year at Southern? Asked Peter, watching for a reaction from Jack. Go ahead, Peter. Tell us, Gary pleads. It was the week before Christmas break, 2004. Jack and I took off the Thursday right before our December finals week. I had an old beat-up 85 Firebird, and we drove all day and all night without any stops to make it to New Orleans. He and I spent the whole weekend hitting every jazz club we could find by night and laying out at the hotel pool all day. You mean our Jack? You too. I can't believe that, bellowed Gary as the others laughed. I never would have thought, boy, you had a wild streak, Jack. I remember that. You had just turned 21 a month before, so we were going to live it up, recalled Jack. And we did, laughed Peter. Yep, those were some fun days. So, what's this about you getting a mountain backpack then? Asked Bob. You have a secret desire to climb a mountain, I suppose? Yeah, I guess so. Kind of hard to do when you're living in Chicago, said Jack. Let's plan a trip, blurted Peter. That's what I've been trying to tell him, Peter, barked Gary. I'm with you. A road trip, just us guys. A weekend trip to Colorado to go climb a mountain. What do you say, Jack? I'd have to check with Julie first. See, that's what I'm saying. I'm so glad I'm single, uttered Gary. I don't have to clear it with anyone first. Just boom, pack my bags and I'm on the road. I wish I could do that, mumbled Peter quietly. What's that, Peter? asked Bob. I wish I could just pack my bags and go on a trip right now, like Gary said. Is everything okay, Peter? asked Jack. Yeah, it's just, well, Trisha and I have been kind of having some problems lately. What do you mean having problems? Like what kind of problems? asked Jack. Promise you won't say anything to Trisha about this, okay? Trisha's real touchy about it, but we've been going to a marriage counselor for the last three months. Really? But I thought you two were like solid and all, blurted Bob. Well, the biggest problem is all the work hours I'm putting in now, but there are other problems too. I mean, I'm at work from seven in the morning until seven at night most days. Then there's the weekend school. That's the one that the district expects us to set up and run for the low achieving students. Well, it takes up most of my Saturdays. Wow, Peter, I guess you need a break too, sighs Gary, almost as bad as Jack. Well, that's it then, urges Bob. We have to plan a getaway just for us guys. Here, here, chimes Gary. I'm with you, Bob, and the sooner the better. Personally, I'd like to see us get motorcycles to do this trip. What? Asks Jack with a slight smirk on his face. That ain't gonna happen with Julie. I like the idea, Jack, adds Bob. Me too, chimes Peter. A road trip, it's what? Gary leans back in his chair, looking at the stars in the sky. About a two days ride from here to Colorado, wouldn't you say? At least, says Peter. Bob, Peter, and Jack begin laughing as Gary gets slightly defensive. Hey, I'm serious. Time for another beer, barks Jack. 
Can I grab an extra for anyone? I've had three already, Jack, says Bob. That's my limit if I'm driving home tonight. Maybe I'll get Marcia to drive. I'll take another one, Jack, says Peter. What about you, Gary? Yeah, why not, booms Gary. Toss me one. Might as well. You guys are missing the whole point anyway. Gary sits back in his chair, sulking slightly for a moment. Jack reaches in the blue tub and pulls out three more cans of beer, tosses one to Peter, and hands the other to Gary before he sits down again. Bob leans over in his chair and faces Gary. No, Gary, I think your idea is a good one. We must give it some more thought. You know, plan it out a bit better. But I like the idea you had of a motorcycle road trip. Take a ride, do something fun, go fishing, see the countryside, just get away for a few days. Hell, we might even be able to talk all the ladies into letting us go with no fits. We can tell them it'll get us out of their hair for a few days. Bob chuckles. Jack raises his can in the air, a toast, to a motorcycle road trip mancation for the four of us, and to our friend Peter here. May he find more free time in his schedule to spend time with Trisha. Here, here, the others echo. The four men raise their cans in unison. As the four continue planning their possible excursions, Jack notices his son Josh at the back door making whispering noises and motioning to get his attention. Psst. Hey, Dad, can you come here a second? asks Josh quietly. Jack gets up and steps over to the door, leaning in close to hear Josh. What's up, Josh? He asks, teetering slightly, suddenly realizing the three beers are beginning to take effect on his equilibrium. What's going on? Have you seen Newton? No, Josh, I haven't seen him. Why are you asking? Oh, no reason. Sorry to bother you, Dad, says Josh, turning back around quickly as Jack hears him running down the hallway to his bedroom. Something's up, Jack realizes but not sure if it's Josh's strange behavior or just the three beers making him think that. Is everything okay, Jack? asks Bob. Yeah, I think so, replies Jack, suddenly hearing a commotion from inside the house and then several loud screams from the family room. Following behind Jack, the other three men jump up and head inside to see what's going on. As Jack moves inside and stands just inside the back door, near the kitchen, he sees Newton run past the china hutch and back into the hallway to the bedrooms, with something white in his mouth. Suddenly, they hear Julie yelling from the family room, Jack, grab your dog quick! Newton has Trixie in his mouth! Newton does a U-turn in the hallway as he sees Josh waiting for him at the bedroom door to block him. By now, Jack is standing at the other end of the hallway. Newton! Put Trixie down right this minute, yells Jack. Newton stands in the middle of the hallway with his tail wagging and a visible rat's tail hanging out of his mouth with Newton's tail wagging also. Well, that's a good sign, thinks Jack. Josh, I thought you boys were going to watch Teddy for us tonight and you promised you wouldn't disturb the party tonight. Sorry, Dad. I thought Teddy would have fun playing with Trixie and that it might keep him occupied while we played games, apologized Josh. I didn't realize he had taken Trixie out of the bedroom. And then I saw Newton. And then, well, you see, says Josh, pointing at Newton. Jack moved in slowly down the hallway towards Newton, as behind him the others watched quietly in amusement from the family room. The closer Jack got, the faster Newton's tail wagged. Now Jack is nearly six foot tall and a good 190 pounds heavy, but Newton isn't a tiny dog either. As Newton lunged, trying to make a break for it down the hallway again, Jack grabbed him with both hands, like a defensive lineman going for a quarterback. There was a loud thud as they landed on the floor, and Jack's head bumped the wall. Almost immediately, Newton's mouth popped open, as Trixie took advantage of the opportunity and made a run for it, right back into Josh's waiting hands. Way to go, Dad. I got her, yelled Josh. Newton and Jack lay still on the floor a moment while Newton decided to take the opportunity to lick Jack in the face. Nice move, Jack. Good thing I'm not your agent. I would be raising your rates with that dog around the house, laughed Gary. Well, on that note, says Trisha, it's getting late and I think we should be going. So, are you men all done? After all that excitement, I should say so, joked Marcia. I thought for a minute there your dog had a toy in his mouth until I saw the little white tail moving and those pink little eyes staring at me. Poor little guy. It's a girl, actually, pipes Jack. Our daughter calls it Trixie. She found it at school a few weeks ago, 
and well, as you can see, it's been the highlight of our household. Gary reaches over and taps Jack and the other two on the shoulders, motioning them to one side of the living room. Hey guys, let's get together again soon and talk about that trip idea, okay? Sure thing, Gary. Maybe next week you guys can come over to my place and watch the White Sox's game on Saturday, suggests Peter. The others nod. Okay then, well you guys all take it easy. It's time for me to take off. Gary begins to leave, but pauses before he steps out the door. And Julie, congratulations for a great party, and you Jack, happy birthday again. Thanks Gary, you drive carefully, says Jack, following his friend outside for a moment. Will do. I'll see you tomorrow at 10. Woohoo! We can sleep in, cheers Gary as he walks down the driveway. Remember Jack, road trip, Jack laughs. I got it, road trip, he repeats, and then turns around to start go back inside, but sees Peter and Trisha heading for the door. He waves to Peter to step out front for a moment. Hey Peter, call me tomorrow or the next day if you can. We'll go have a cup of coffee or something, okay? Peter nods. Sounds good, Jack. Hey, I'm sorry to bring your party down tonight. Peter sighs. What do you mean bring my party down? You know, bringing up mine and Trisha's marriage problems. It's okay, Peter. You helped me realize something tonight. We've got to get together more often. If nothing else than to just let off some steam, like we all did tonight. Yeah, you're right. That road trip idea of Gary's sounds cool. I always wanted an excuse to get me a motorcycle. Jack laughs. Yeah, well, Gary is one of those, you know who kind of live on the edge anyway. He's not tied down to anything, I guess. But yeah, it did sound cool. They heard Trisha and Julie starting to come out the front door. Jack pats Peter on his shoulder. Hey, like I said, give me a call. We'll go talk. Sure. Jack watched as his friend Peter and Trisha got in their car and drove off, followed by the others. He wasn't sure what it was about tonight, but something inside him had been sparked by the conversations he had with his friends about taking a road trip together. As Jack turned around to go back inside, he started dreaming again. He pictured he and Peter hiking up the side of Mount Whitney in the summertime. Chapter four, gone in an instant. The next day, Jack's alarm clock on his nightstand went off at its usual time. There was something different about the music, however, then Jack remembered switching stations right before he went to bed. Now it's playing a rock song that takes Jack a few moments to recognize. He lays with his eyes closed, listening. I'm getting edgy all the time. There's someone round me all the time. The song continued. Jack rolls over and tries to snooze as the music continues. Offspring, that's the name of the band. Think I'm on a roll, but I think it's kind of weak saying all I know is I gotta get away from me. Jack hums along with the song for a few moments. What are you listening to? Asks Julie, somewhat sarcastically, stepping into the room. I changed the station last night before I went to sleep. Sounds like awful music to wake up to if you ask me. I like it. It's different for a change. Jack rolls over out of the bed and places his feet on the floor. Oh, my aching head. What's that? Asks Julie while putting her makeup on in the bathroom. My head hurts. I haven't had that many beers in quite a while, moaned Jack. Julie comes out and stands in the doorway of the bedroom a moment, giving Jack a brief look of sympathy. Well, that'll teach you. The Tylenol is in the bathroom, second shelf, if you need it. Oh, gee, thanks. Jack stands up, realizing it isn't as bad as he thought. Just bad enough. No Tylenol necessary. Then he frowns. Damn, what am I thinking? I don't have to go in early this morning. Jack takes his time getting ready, realizing routines go a lot differently when you don't have to be somewhere early and you have a little extra time to enjoy the morning. As Jack walks into the kitchen for his third cup of coffee, Julie is busy pulling things out of her purse and setting them on the counter. Did you lose something, honey? No, I was just trying to find my paycheck they gave us on Monday. I've been so busy, I haven't deposited it in the bank yet. Julie looks up at him, tilting her head slightly to the side with that look she often gets when she has a favor to ask for something she forgot to do, but now wants him to do it for her. Wait, Jack holds his hand up. Don't tell me you want to know if I can run that by the bank for you this morning. Julie smiles. Thanks, sweetie. Have a good day. 
I need to take the kids in a few minutes earlier than usual this morning. They are having some sort of pep rally at school this morning. Enjoy your late morning. Thanks, I will. About that time, Jack notices Ellen and Josh running out of their bedrooms with their backpacks on. Have a good day, you two, he hollers as they run out the front door. I got Teddy, so you are all clear, says Julie, starting to head for the door. Bye, sweetie. Jack gives Julie as quick kiss on the cheek as she turns and leaves. He watches as the four of them pull out the driveway and head off to school. Jack takes a deep breath in and lets out a long sigh, thinking to himself, wow, now I've got extra time this morning before I leave, extra time to dream about the mountains. Jack had no sooner turned onto Randall Road and began heading south as his thoughts began to drift off. He started thinking about the party last night and how good it was to spend time with his friends, sitting, talking, enjoying a few drinks, and letting off some steam. He needed that more than he realized, and apparently the others did too. He thinks for a moment about his friends Peter and Trisha, hoping that they can work things out. It has also been a busy year for him and Julie, as he realizes that they hadn't taken any vacation time since last summer, nearly 10 months ago. He tries to think of a time when they had gone anywhere other than Jacksonville, Florida, or Sacramento, California. There isn't a whole lot to do in either one of those places after you've been going there year after year. Even the kids were beginning to protest. He would have to push for a change. But that would prove difficult, he knew, for Julie. She felt a strong commitment to having the kids spend as much time as possible with all the grandparents. There were many things he loved about Julie, her sense of order and routines he found comforting sometimes, but he always longed for more adventure. An adventure, it seemed, always put Julie out of her comfort zone. Jack's gray sedan was approaching the intersection close to the bank, where he would need to deposit the check for Julie, as he noticed the familiar-looking car pulling up in the lane next to him. It was his friend Peter, probably heading into his school, which was not far from here. The light was turning yellow as they neared the intersection, and Jack waited until he had pulled up next to Peter's car to roll his window down and get his attention. Peter saw him. Hey there, bud. Going into school, huh? Yeah. Finished up our district meeting this morning, and I'm headed over to my school, hollered Peter through his passenger side window. Had a great time last night. We have got to get together again soon, he shouted. I like your idea about coffee sometime. Give me a call. I'll be home around six, shouted Jack, thinking that the light should be turning green soon. I will. See you later, Jack, hollered Peter, looking at him out of the window as he took off into the intersection. Jack had only hesitated for a few microseconds as he looked around for to find Julie's check, which he found lying in the seat next to him. Those few microseconds were just enough, it seemed, to make the difference. Perhaps it was the sudden eerie silence, as if all sound and space had suddenly been swallowed up. Or maybe it was the sudden screeching of tires and steel that quickly jolted Jack's eyes back up onto the roadway in front of him. Either way, Jack only caught a quick flash of white, followed by the shattering sounds of crushing steel and glass meeting in the air right before him in the intersection. After that, everything moved as if in slow motion. He could see Peter's car in the road ahead of him being swept entirely off to his right by some massive object. For what seemed like an eternity, he watched, helplessly, as Peter's car flew to the side and spun around once and once more again until it slammed into a pole. When everything finally came to a stop, he immediately pulled his car over to the side and jumped out. There was no way Jack could have prepared himself for what he was to see next as he made his way around to the driver's side of Peter's car. He could tell something was seriously wrong as the driver's side of the car was missing. When he bent over to get a better look inside, he saw Peter pinned against the opposite side of his car with the aluminum part of the door from the driver's side shoved into Peter's side and chest. Peter, he shouted. Peter, no response. Jack ran around to the other side of the car and tried desperately to open the other door. No luck. Damn, he cursed to himself. He continued to pull and pull on the door as hard as he could, but no luck. Jack looked all around the door for something to grab hold of to pull the door open. 
If only he had a tire iron, he thought. Just then, he looked down at Peter and noticed his eyelids fluttering, and then they opened and looked up at him. Jack, is that you? asked the soft, garbling voice as Peter tried to speak. Hang on, Peter. Hang on. I'm trying to get your door opened, he said, suddenly looking around the car for something to use to pry open the door. He then noticed that there were several people standing around him and Peter's car. He noticed that some of them had their phones out. Hopefully they're calling 911, thought Jack. My phone, of course, why didn't I think? It's right on my side, continued Jack in his self-chastisement for a moment longer until he finally dismissed it, realizing that surely someone had already phoned it in. What happened? Peter asked. You were hit in the intersection, Peter. Keep talking to me. Keep talking. Didn't, didn't see anything coming. Hey, has anyone here called 911 yet? shouted Jack. Yeah, I did just a few minutes ago. They should have an ambulance here any minute. Replies a tall, older black man wearing a pair of gray overalls that read JJ's Plumbing Service. Anyone here have a tire iron in their car or anything else that we can use to get this door open with? hollered Jack. I got some tools in my truck. Hang on, mister. I'll go get something, promises the man in overalls. Thanks, replied Jack, turning back to Peter. Peter? Peter, can you hear me? Peter replied slowly. Yeah, Jack, where's that movie going to be playing tonight? He asked. Movie? What movie? Jack asked, wondering if Peter was hallucinating. I want to take Jillian to go see it, mumbled Peter. Okay, Peter, we'll go see it. But you got to stay awake, okay? Sure, I'll stay awake. Can't wait to see Mel wearing a kilt, laughed Peter softly. Suddenly, Jack remembered that he and Peter had taken girlfriends years ago to the opening of the movie Braveheart together. They never realized how graphic it was, or they might have chosen a different movie for a date night. Hey, mister, I hear the sirens coming. Here's the largest wrench I could find. We could try this, insisted the man in overalls. If I were you, though, I'd wait for them to bring the heavy equipment in. The man quickly stopped talking, realizing that Jack wasn't going to give up. Jack grabbed the wrench from the man and shoved it into the crack near the back of the door pulling on it as hard as he could. Even with help from the several other men who were standing around, they still couldn't free the door open. Stay with me, Peter. Help is on the way, Jack begged Peter. Hey, Jack, promise me something, will you? What's that, Peter? Promise me you'll take that road trip with the guys sooner rather than later, okay? Mumbled Peter in between gasping for breath. I will, Peter. You just hang on there and we'll get you out of here. Behind him, he heard the sirens getting closer. Hey, mister, you might need to move your car. I believe that fire truck is going to need to get in here, explained the man in overalls, looking at Jack sympathetically. Son, was that you driving that gray sedan over there parked on the side of the road? He asks. Yes, it was, replies Jack. Well, I'll be damned. Must be your lucky day, son. Just a few more feet into the intersection, and that bus would have taken both of you fellas out. Imagine that. Jack quickly ran over to his car and moved it over out of the way as he saw a large fire truck move in behind him, followed immediately by an ambulance. After he pulled around into a parking lot nearby, he noticed the large white bus that had hit Peter off to the side of the road up on the grass. The bus was one of those medium-sized ones that are used to haul senior citizens around. For a few moments, Jack hesitated to get out of his car again. He sat and quietly watched for a minute or two as the paramedics rushed over to tend to his friend Peter. Then he saw them lifting Peter up onto a gurney as he stepped out of his car and walked over. As Jack got closer, he saw two of the paramedics with equipment slung over their shoulders while one of them appeared to be trying to do CPR. Just then he saw the tall black man again and tapped him on the shoulder. How's he doing, sir? Can you tell? The tall gentleman turned around and gave Jack a face, a certain kind of face that sort of said it all. I'm sorry, son. I don't think he's going to make it. I just heard them say something about his heart stopping a minute ago. Jack froze. It's just a shame, I tell you. Just a shame. He looked so young, too. Did I hear you say that you know that man? He was my best friend, mumbled Jack, as he turned and staggered slowly back to his car. Jack quietly sat in the front seat of his car for several more minutes, 
watching as the paramedics continued working feverishly to revive his friend Peter. Eventually, he watched them as they covered up his face with a sheet as they gently lifted him up into the ambulance. It was at that very moment that something inside Jack changed, but he just didn't know it yet, like a switch being turned off. Some of us have moments like that in our life where one single event, either so profane or so profound or so drastically evocative, can change our lives forever. This was Jack's moment. It was as if all feeling had been suddenly stripped away from his mind and body, and the only thing he felt was numb. The old Jack had suddenly been thrown into a cocoon and a new Jack was being created. As Jack sat there and watched in silence, the words of the tall man in overalls came back again and again to him. It's your lucky day, son. A few more feet and that bus would have taken both of you men out. At that moment, Jack wished that it had. Chapter five, on the open road. Nearly an hour after the accident, and after giving all his information and witness statements to the police, Jack started up his car and drove out of the parking lot and back onto the main road. Driving slowly in the right lane, he could hear the horns of cars honking behind him in protest to his extremely slow and cautious driving. Jack began to pull into the parking lot of the bank, but changed his mind at the last second. He turned his car instead, into a local gas mart and parked it in an open parking lot next door to the store. There he sat, silent and alone for several minutes. Jack was a complete blank on the inside, not sure if he wanted to cry, scream, or die. When he finally got out of his car and entered the store, he slowly paced up and down the small aisles, looking at all the bags of chips, cans of food, or bottles of beer stored around in the freezers. Then something finally caught his eye. He saw the coffee cups and smelled the fresh brewed coffee. He always loved the smell of fresh coffee. Grabbing one of the extra large 44 ounce thermal soda cups with a handle from the top of the counter, he filled it to the top with fresh hot coffee. Normally, Jack liked to add a little sugar or cream to his coffee, but no, not this time. He just filled it to the top with hot coffee and tapped the lid on top. He stepped up behind a rather large gray-haired lady in a green dress who appeared to be about 70 years old. She held a small cup of soda in one hand and a little piece of paper in the other, which she handed the young girl who was working behind the counter. As the young clerk took hold of the little paper, she cheered for the lady. Congratulations, Mabel. It's your lucky day. Obviously, she knew her. The old lady roared, So, how much did I win today? The clerk looked at the ticket again. It says here, you won $25 on the Crazy Eights game. Wow, I guess it's my lucky day after all for the second time today, she shouts. How is that? asks the young clerk. Well, a little while ago, I was riding over here to the recreation center in that large white bus that picks us up every Wednesday morning. And as we started to go through the intersection just down the road here, they said that our bus lost its brakes. And well, the next thing I knew, we'd crashed into another car right in the middle of the intersection. Luckily, my niece over there, Mabel pointed. She doesn't live too far away, and so she came to pick me up and give me a ride to the center. Gee, Mabel, I guess it is your lucky day after all. Well, you go and enjoy yourself at the store, grinned the clerk, as Jack walked up to the counter with his extra-large coffee and set it down with a noticeable thud. Good morning, sir. Gee whiz, you must really like coffee. I don't think I've ever seen anyone fill up a 44-ounce soda cup with hot coffee before. Are you sure you want that much? Said the clerk, eyeing the cup up and down as Jack set it on the counter. Yes, I do. I will have to charge you a little differently than a regular cup of coffee, if that's okay with you. No problem. And how about selling me a few of those Crazy Eights cards like Mabel had a minute ago? Make it five of them. I'm feeling lucky today. Okay, sir. Hold on. One extra large coffee and five Crazy Eights tickets. Hmm. That will be $13.75, said the clerk. Jack gave the girl a $20 bill while he started scratching at the first of his five Crazy Eights tickets. The first and second tickets went quickly. Nothing. Then started on the third, and he suddenly stopped scratching, flipping it repeatedly in his hand. Hmm he mumbled, as he looked at it carefully for a moment or two, and then handed the ticket to the clerk. 
Well, I'll be. Look at that. It's your lucky day, too, she said. Well, sir, looks like you just won $500. Congratulations. Jack grinned as some of the customers applauded for him. If they only knew how my day was going, he thought. The clerk rang up his coffee and new cup and paid out the remainder of his winnings for his ticket. As Jack grabbed his coffee off the counter and turned around to head out of the store. Hey, mister, what about your other two tickets? You didn't scratch them yet. Don't you want to see if they are winners also? The clerk asked. Jack reached over to the counter and opened his hand up as the other two Crazy Eights tickets dropped down out of his hand and landed on top of the counter. Nope, why don't you go ahead and give them to someone else? Who knows, with all the good luck going on around here today, it's got to be good luck for someone else, right? Jack grins as the young girl gives him a strange look. Jack returned to his car and sat inside for over an hour, not caring about the time of day or whether he was late for work or not. He just sat and watched the people going to and from the little gas mart, trying to imagine what was going through their minds or how their day had been going for them so far. Finally, after an hour of people watching, Jack started his car up and drove to the bank, which was only a block or two away. From the moment Jack started driving, he really hadn't decided what his next action would be. It was as if his life was now being controlled by some external force. Jack drove around the shopping center for a little while, then he started to go inside, then turned around and continued driving around again, aimlessly. Suddenly, in his aimless roaming, something caught his eye. It was a used motorcycle shop that he had probably passed by every day for the last 10 years and never noticed it until now. Rogers Road Rods was the name on front of the establishment. Jack parked his car and walked inside. He remembered his dad having a small moped that he drove around the neighborhood. His dad used to say to him, with a slight southern accent in his voice, Son, one of these days I'm going to get me a hog. And then he'd laugh. He'd laugh out loud like he never heard his dad laugh before, like a giddy little schoolboy who had just pulled a trick on someone. Jack never quite understood why, until now. May I help you, sir? asked the salesman who was dressed in old 501 Levis and a light blue plaid shirt with the tail hanging out. Standing in front of Jack with his silvery hair and beard, he looked to be about the same age as his father. I'm looking for a motorcycle, but I don't know which one I want to get. Jack motioned to all the bikes lined up in his store. They all seem, well, good. The man laughed for a moment. Well, yes, they are all good and we offer a warranty on each one of them for three years or 60,000 miles. I can better help you look for the right one if you give me an idea of what you want to do with the bike, he asked. By the way, my name is James Sykes. Most people just call me Jimmy, he said, offering his hand to Jack. Shaking his hand, well, Jimmy, I want to travel. I just want to get on the road and go. Colorado, Las Vegas, heck, maybe even Alaska, explained Jack. Okay, all right. Well, that helps considerably. Come over here and I will show you a couple of my best road bikes. You're gonna want a road bike, trust me. They are more comfortable to ride over long distances. We call these kinds of bikes cruisers. Have you done a lot of long distant bike rides before? Asked Jimmy. Well, no, I haven't. Okay, like I said, you'll want a cruiser, like maybe this one over here. I have a Yamaha FJR 1300, which is a very nice bike, lots of power for the highway, and a comfortable ride. This one is a 2018 model, and it has a little over 20,000 miles on it. Now my price is 13,000 on this beauty. I also have a brand new Honda Goldwing over here, fully loaded, on sale right now for 28,000. Jack continued following the salesman around, sort of alone with his thoughts, until the salesman came to a shiny blue metallic cruiser. There was just something about the blue paint job that got Jack excited. What about this one here? This one? Well, yeah, that's a nice cruiser too. It's a 2012 Honda ST1300, a real beastie, but it's been taken care of. If you like, I can get you a real good deal on it since the man who's selling it, he's one of our mechanics right here in the shop. Again, like I said, we offer a full warranty on all our bikes. How much are you asking for it? Well, let me run it by George a minute. 
I'll see how much he's willing to deal with you for it, since it is his bike and he hasn't put it up for sale just yet, said Jimmy, starting to walk over to the shop. Tell George I want to know his cash price, asked Jack, keeping his eyes glued on the bike as he began to drift off in his imagination. He was on the road to Colorado. Jack heard Jimmy calling out Jack's offer from the shop. George says, six grand, and it's yours right now, he says, cash. Jack nods, 6,000 cash. I'll take it. How soon can it be ready? Jack asked. George heard Jack's question. I'll have it cleaned up and ready for you in an hour. She just needs a few things taken care of first. Will that work for you? George hollered from the shop. Yes, sounds great. I'm going to run over to the bank and be back in about an hour. Thanks, said Jack as he headed out the door. Good morning, Mr. Kettle, and what can I do for you this morning? asks the young teller from behind the long counter. Jack slides his identification card along with Julie's check across the counter to the young man. I would like to deposit this check here for my wife, and then I would like to make a withdrawal from my savings account. Very good. Give me just a moment while I bring up your account, replies the teller, as his fingers dance across the computer keyboard. This check that is for your wife, do you want it deposited into savings or checking, he asked. I'd like it put into checking, please. The teller continues typing into the computer as a small sheet of paper begins printing up of to the side. The teller rips off the paper and hands it to Jack. I just need your initials on this, please. Will there be anything else that I can do for you this morning, Mr. Kettle? Yes. I would like to make a cash withdrawal of $10,000 from my savings account, please, asks Jack. No problem, sir. Oh, Mr. Kettle, just so you're aware, I will need to get the manager to approve this withdrawal first. It's bank policy for any amount over $10,000, you understand? Explains the teller. A few seconds later, the bank manager comes over around behind the teller and looks over the computer screen and then looks back at Jack. Good morning, Mr. Kettle. It's good to see you again. I understand you wish to make a cash withdrawal from your savings account this morning? Yes, I would. Very well, Mr. Kettle. Just so you know, I'm required by the bank to ask you as to the purpose for such a large cash withdrawal. I'm purchasing a motor vehicle from a private party, and they are asking for cash only. I see. Well, hang on just a moment insists the manager, looking over the computer. Normally, Mr. Kettle, we have a policy that any cash withdrawals over $10,000 require a waiting period. However, since you have been a customer with us for over 10 years and your account is in excellent standing, I will waive that this time, explains the manager, smiling. I will note that you are using this to purchase a vehicle. Well, thank you very much. Jack smiles back. No problem. I gave Mr. Martinez here authorization to complete your transaction. Have a nice day, Mr. Kettle. You too. Thank you. An hour later, Jack was now sitting on the seat of his shiny metallic blue Honda Cruiser. Jimmy the salesman at Rogers Road Rods was even so nice as to have the gas tank topped off and the bike cleaned and polished up for him before he picked it up. Afterwards, Jack carefully pulled his bike up next to his car which he had parked at a large retail parking lot just a few blocks away. Jack got out and meticulously cleaned everything up inside of it. Finally, he took his briefcase out of the front seat, tossing his old work papers he had sitting on the seat inside the case, closed it up and placed it neatly into the trunk of his car, leaving Julie's deposit slip lying across the top. Then, just as he was about to close the trunk, he noticed his brand new backpack was still sitting in there from the office. He lifted it up out of the trunk and placed it up onto the back seat of his new motorcycle, then carefully closed and locked up the car. There, he mumbled to himself, I'm ready, nothing else to my name. Jack said to no one in particular as he strapped down the empty backpack on the bike and put on his helmet. Jack then climbed onto his motorcycle and rode off down the highway heading west not looking behind him, with nothing else except the afternoon sun in his face and the world as he once knew it in his rearview mirror. It's difficult to really understand what goes through a person's mind after experiencing serious trauma. Trauma is a normal part of each of our lives, but can affect us each differently. These unexpected life experiences may often direct our paths in strange and mysterious ways. 
As for Jack Kettle, the events of the day so far have brought on an unexplainable sense of euphoria over Jack. It was as if something had come along and shut down most of his emotional circuit breakers. From this moment, nothing else in Jack's life seemed important, except for the desire to run and escape his life. Neither his career, his family, not even his very own existence was important to him. Right now, Jack felt a burning need to get away and not look back. All too often in the news, we hear stories about people who go through some extreme emotional trauma and then suddenly turn around and commit equally horrendous acts of crime on others. But rarely do we hear about the silent victims of trauma who end up punishing themselves since not all scars are on the outside. Now you may be quick to pass judgment on Jack for what he has done so far or for what he about to do in the coming days ahead. But don't be too hasty in your criticisms or judgments. For the bizarre circle of events that are about to take place in Jack's near future may very well be punishment enough.